Hey folks, um, so today we're going to have a look at managing coasts and specifically soft engineering. So if you just pop that as your title. Now this is going to become kind of more and more prevalent or more and more popular as time goes on because it's far less expensive than hard engineering options. So we're looking at soft engineering, this is more natural and cheaper. Now for AQA, because that's remember the exam board that I'm helping you prepare for, um, you need to know at least two types. So we're going to look at two different ones. We are going to look at something called beach nourishment on the side, which is there, beach nourishment. And we're also going to have a look at sand dune regeneration on this side. Now these two are two really important types of soft engineering and they are also enough to get you uh, easily into a six marker. So, And remember there are no nine markers in the coast section of paper one. So yeah, this will be absolutely plenty for you and I'm gonna as I always do I'm just gonna make these as simple as possible and break them down into sort of easy to remember steps. Okay so for beach nourishment if you can just draw like a coastline any sort of shape doesn't really matter on this side okay um, this is the sea over here and this is the land all right. So what beach nourishment is essentially is adding material, material like sand or shingle, back onto the land where the sea has taken it away through various types of erosion. Okay, destructive waves being the main one. Now if you ever get to see this, it is pretty impressive. So very often you have a big boat, something um, like a barge, that is brought in at basically like a, a nice uh, kind of high tide. So they'll bring it in as high as they can. Um, so yes, just draw kind of a barge on there. And then what it does is it kind of fires the sand and shingle in like a rainbow format really um, at the beach. Okay, so if we draw an arrow going in that direction and pop in but it's basically like an arch or like a bridge of sand and shingle and it's full of water as well. So it's being fired at the beach. Now this material has been basically dredged up by another boat or by this boat um, further out in the channel and then it's just being fired back at the beach. So this is um, dredged material. Now you'll have come across the word dredged before, possibly in rivers, when they look at dredging rivers to make them deeper. Well, it's exactly the same with coasts. So they dredge the material from harbours or out at, you know, on the, on the shallow seas. Now it's not too expensive. This is gonna sound expensive, but it isn't too bad considering how much hard engineering methods are. It is approximately half a million pounds or 500,000 pounds per 100 metres. Okay, and that is, if you think about running the 100 metres, that's quite a big section and that is adding a huge amount of sand and shingle to the beach. Now, the other thing they sometimes do within beach nourishment is they get rid of the barge and they don't worry about firing it onto the beach. And instead what they do is they move the material. So if we put A here in a circle and B over here. Now you know with longshore drift you get swash and backwash. Swash and backwash and so on. Okay, now when this happens, material moves its way along the coast from longshore drift. So what we tend to find is that material from A gets moved via 
longshore drift to be. And with beach nourishment, what they might do is they might just get some diggers and some trucks and they basically just move it back to A, okay? This happens at Hailing Island, near where I teach and work. Every single winter, this happens. They go and remove some of the sand and shingle from the kind of eastern end of the beach and they bring it back to the western end, okay? So I'm just gonna write that in there. So material, I keep using the word material. What I mean is stones or shingle is um, basically moved from an area of surplus. So that's where there's more than is needed to an area of deficit. E.g. at Hailing. Okay, Hailing Island. Um, and then when that material has been moved, it might be pushed up the beach, um, like reprofiling, it might be used diggers to kind of make it taller and more of a defense. Now, the really good thing about beach nourishment, I'm gonna put a big, really big smiley face in here, and this goes for sand dune regeneration as well, is that it is relatively cheap. Okay, so that's really good for taxpayers' income and not wasting money on sea defences that aren't working. Um, it also attracts tourists. Now, if the beach is really devoid of sand and shingle, that's not gonna encourage people to want to visit and it's not gonna help local economies with you know ice cream sales and shops and things and hotels. So it's really good if the beach is nicely built up. Okay, and the other thing is, you know, you or I wouldn't even know it happened because it blends in beautifully, it's supernatural. Unfortunately, if we just put a little sad face in here, it does need constant renewal. So I'm gonna put in there, it needs constant uh, kind of maintenance, maintenance or renewal. Unfortunately, that can be every year. And the reason it's every year is it doesn't take much, like a big storm will do it, will take away a lot of the material. Uh, so it's really important that they just keep moving it back and keep adding to the beach. Okay, so that's beach nourishment. You can talk about that in an exam with I think some confidence now. Um, so moving on to sand dune regeneration. I think the best thing here is if we kind of just draw a couple of, couple of wonky sand dunes, there you go. Um, now, sand dunes have got this kind of, just draw it on roughly, kind of marum grass it's called. If you've ever walked on a sand dune, you'll know what I'm talking about there. Kind of spiky plants, um, quite tall grasses, they can come up past your knees. And yeah, they're amazing. In fact, I'm gonna call it, I'm gonna write it on there, it's called marum grass. It's extra special because it can grow right by the sea, it doesn't mind the salt. Weirdly, its roots mind the salt, so if they become exposed, it can get into trouble. But uh, yeah, for the most part, absolutely fine. Now the other thing I wanna draw on here, just quickly, is um, kind of a couple of fence posts. Okay, let's have another one up there. And one here. So, go around there, around there. Okay, so we've got our fence posts in place. It doesn't matter how many you have, but let's just pop them in there. So, marum grass uh, is in there, our fence post, let's put number one next to our fence post and number two next to our marum grass. So, number one, these fence posts have a proper name. They're called dune fencing. I'm gonna put that in capitals. Why would you have fences 
on a dune, you ask? Well, they're built there to encourage the dunes to actually form, and they're actually built carefully on the seaward side, so they are nearest the sea. I think that's called the seaward side. Uh, basically what happens is those posts are rooted into the sand and they actually stabilise that baby dune and they allow the sand to accumulate around them. So they actually encourage new dune formation. So they encourage dune formation. And I've got another video on this about how sand dunes form. But basically if you have any kind of obstruction, like a fence, I mean, even a piece of seaweed can do it. Sand will start to accumulate around it. Um, and these new dunes that are forming will then protect the older dunes which are behind them. Okay, and, and also, uh, additionally, plus, you know, they keep people off. Um, and the reason that's good is because people basically trample on the sand dunes. I, I do it myself. I love walking around on sand dunes and and having fun but new baby sand dunes do need to be left alone so they can become established so it also keeps people off the new dunes okay so fences do that I mean it won't keep everyone off some people will climb over them but for the most part it's really good now cost wise the cost is one thousand pounds per 100 meters. So you'll see it's quite a lot cheaper than our beach nourishment, but obviously these fences, again, they're not gonna last forever. So they do need regular maintenance, and we'll come back to that again in a minute. First of all, let's go to number two. And again, I'm gonna put that in capitals. So we've got our maram grass. Um, now the grass kind of does what the dune fencing does, is it roots into the sand and it stabilises the sand, which is like amazing. This is what nature does, it often just does the thing that we try and recreate in a different way. So maram grass, the roots, uh, what we want to say, the roots stabilise the sand and stop stop it basically blowing away in the wind okay so they're really really clever and really cheap so the cost of those that is only 200 pounds per 100 meters and that does actually require people to plant them but very often volunteers will get involved so people that might be retired or don't you know, have to work every day, they will go and they will do that. And again, the positives of this, let's have a big smiley face over here, is it maintains a natural environment. Um, and if you've been anywhere with sand dunes, East Head is, um, and West Wittering is our closest one, it is amazing to look at them. They are so beautiful, uh, a lovely sight, and not just a lovely sight, but doing its job, you know, to protect the coast. Um, but again, unfortunately, same as before, the negatives are, and it is only a small negative that this time, is they can be damaged by storms. Okay, so, so there's positives and negatives to both. Like I said, that will get you through easily, like a six marker. You might have a smaller one where you'll only need to talk about one of them but I really hope that helps you.